Well, the, good afternoon. Thank you all so much for coming. My name is uh, Dan Plesch. Uh, I'm an academic at the School of Oriental and African Studies, and this is nothing to do with my day job. Uh, I'm also the chair of a, a small uh, educational charity, what in uh, the old days used to be called a, a ginger group, uh, called Our Democratic Heritage. Uh, this is uh, uh, the third and by far and away the most uh, illustrious uh, activity that we've been done recently. My colleagues from Royal Holloway recently uh, conducted a live interpretation of events uh, at the banqueting house of a conversation between uh, King Charles and uh, one of his level of guards. Uh, and uh, shortly before, another of them uh, conducted a live interpretation event of a, a suffragette guided tour um, in costume along the Strand and to Westminster. Um, but uh, that fun those, though those uh, events were and useful though they were, they paled into insignificance uh, compared to uh, our partnership with uh, the St Paul's Institute and with the uh, historians and chapter for today's events. This evening uh, we have a, a public discussion and I was told don't push this because we're completely full but nevertheless um, a, a discussion on, uh, on social movements and, uh, and democracy. Um, so very much a 20th, uh, 21st century uh, discussion. Uh, but uh, as part of our uh, discussions with uh, Robert and, and Peter over recent months, we, I think, all have a sense that there is a, um, uh, a lack of uh, uh, expression within our culture overall about our democratic heritage, but in particular, uh, democratic or not, the, the social and political and religious um, uh, background uh, and context to St Paul's uh, isn't uh, prominent enough in the environment of the cathedral and part of this uh, foundational uh, academic discussion is to look in uh, closer detail as, as we can at uh, what we can really say about uh, some of the uh, uh, events and activities in uh, a foundational period in the 16th and 17th centuries. Uh, and that's our, uh, our business this, uh, this afternoon, a happy one, I would say, not a business, a happy discussion. Um, there are no, um, no limits to my ignorance of the details of this subject. Um, so I'm, I'm honoured to uh, have been allowed to, uh, to chair, the, uh, chair the discussion. Um, we will hear, and I'll introduce them now, and then we'll just uh, take the, the presentations. Uh, from three uh, extremely distinguished uh, scholars. Uh, Peter McCulloch, uh, who will speak first, is uh, a lay canon here at the cathedral uh, with a special responsibility for input on historical matters. And this includes in, uh, the interpretation project, which I alluded to a few moments ago, which is a long-term project concerned with bringing St. Paul's to life for all of its visitors. And he's a leading expert and widely published writer on the religious history of early modern England, including the book trade that was so uh, uh, vibrant uh, for centuries around the cathedral. Um, he is also general editor of the Oxford edition of the Sermons of John Donne. Um, and there was a great discussion between the panelists before we sat down about John Donne, about which I understood absolutely nothing. Uh, This 16-volume edition, uh, funded by the Arts and Humanities Research Council, reassesses uh, the greatest prose works uh, that emanated from St Paul's Cathedral's most famous dean. So that's, uh, that's Peter. Um, to be followed by uh, Dr David Koku, um, who is senior lecturer in English down the road at Queen Mary, where he teaches Renaissance literature he is the author of Freedom of Speech in Early Stuart England and has recently completed an edition of John Donne's sermons uh, preached at the court of Charles I. And so I think that makes him a, a particularly uh, apposite uh, contributor to our uh, concern on the uh, questions of the origins and understandings of, uh, of speech uh, and expression and radical ideas 
uh, at that time in this location. And last but by no means at least, to uh, coin a cliché or repeat a cliché, um, Mary Morrissey is a lecturer in the Department of English Language and Literature at the University of Reading. Um, she is the author of, the, of Politics and the Paul's Cross Sermons, 1558 to 1642, uh, and is editing John Donne's uh, Paul's Cross and Spittle Sermons for the uh, Oxford editions of the sermons. So uh, I think we will uh, hear a, a delightful trio of accounts of this uh, critical period uh, in the history of this, of this island and beyond. So without uh, more ado, I will hand over to, to Peter. Thank you. Thank you. This talk is in more than the usual sense introductory, as it falls to me to introduce the circumstance, the object, and this might come as a surprise, the person who bring us here this afternoon. Both the pressures of time and our desire as panelists and organizers that the discussion constitute a major part of this session mean that I will try to focus on facts rather than interpretation of them in the hope that in the time after the talks we can do so collectively. The object that I have to introduce is this one, the monument to St. Paul's Cross which stands in the north churchyard of the cathedral and the inscriptions on it um, are on your handout, and I'll refer to those in the course of the talk. So that for the object. <clears throat> the circumstance, generally, that brings us together, or at least prompted this session, was uh, last year's Occupy protest. But more specifically, it was the alertness of two postgraduate students affiliated with our co-sponsors, our democratic heritage, who noticed at that time the apparent irony that while the North Churchyard was kept locked by the cathedral and corporation while the encampment was outside, there stood inside those railings this monument memorializing a place, as it says, whereat amid such scenes of good and evil as make up human affairs, the conscience of church and nation through five centuries found public utterance. Moreover, the cathedral's own history pages on its website interpret St. Paul's Cross's past as, quote, a popular center of news and comment where generations of Londoners played their role in fomenting public opinion. Now, Dr. Morrissey and Dr. Colclough will share with us their expertise about public speech in the pulpit's heyday in the 16th and early 17th century and help us test those historical claims. But my part is to give us some sense of what Londoners in the early 20th century thought that they were commemorating in erecting a monument to St. Paul's Cross. And this brings me to the person I have to introduce, the donor of the monument, who, as you can see from the transcription of the plaques on the monument, was Henry Charles Richards, a QC and MP for Finsbury East from 1895 until his unexpected death at the age of 54 in 1905. And thanks to a gift to the National Portrait Gallery from the House of Commons Library, I can introduce you to him a bit more vividly. The memorial plaques tell us what Richards's executors thought important for us to know about his CV, as well as his memorial motives, which included family. But fleshing these facts out with a few others might, I think, enrich our understanding of the monument through its donor. To begin with, the Richardses were in some ways model Victorian Londoners, with roots in trade, which over the century bore comfortable wealth. The MP's father was proprietor of a large linen draperers on Church Street in Hackney, where when Henry was 10, the censuses showed that his father employed and housed 13 assistants in addition to his family. Henry himself was sent first to the City of London School at its Victorian site in Milk Street, just across Cheapside, during which time he was a choir boy at St. Lawrence Jewry, and then to a proprietary school in Gravesend. And after 15 years in business, he changed careers by training in law and was called to the bar as a Bacon Scholar at Gray's Inn in 1881, took silk in 1888, and was elected treasurer of the inn in the year of his death. As a barrister, he resided and practiced in the mitre buildings in the temple and in the vacations at a seaside home in St. Leonard's on Sea, which he inherited from his father. Politically then, it may come as no surprise to learn that Richards was a Tory, but of a particular sort, perhaps. According to the who's who of British members of Parliament, Richards was, quote, a democratic Tory in favor of social reforms, the union of church and state, denominational schools, old age pensions, redistribution of seats, and better housing for the working classes. 
His Times obit put this well in Edwardian terms, quote, he defeated Mr. James Rowlands in East Finsbury, a metropolitan division which had been regarded as an almost impregnable liberal stronghold, and his persistent championship of the working class voters who dominate this constituency made so profound an impression that in 1900 he increased his majority from 270 to 347. That Times obit goes on to observe that Richards threw himself as vigorously into church affairs as he did into politics, and indeed it is in that newspaper's ecclesiastical intelligence columns that Richard appear, Richards appears most, and I think gives us the best way to situate his benefaction of a Paul's Cross monument. Dating from his days as a chorister at St. Lawrence Jewelry, Richards was almost obsessed with the protection of the Wren City churches. Aged only 26, he became chairman of the city branch of the Church Defense Institution and was instrumental in founding the City Church and Churchyard Preservation Society. Reflecting the slightly dimmer view of preservationism that was then dominant in the city, the Times observed in the obit that opinions may differ as to the wisdom of rejecting every proposal for the removal of a city church, but Mr. Richards's action was thoroughly sincere. But such it is that we find Richards noted in the press for opposing the construction of a brewery in the former churchyard of All Hallows Thames Street, opposing the amalgamation of two city parishes, and urging all city incumbents faced with committees of inquiry into their viability, quote, to open their churches on weekdays for rest and meditation, and also for short, bright services. I didn't elaborate on what exactly that was, but... <laughs> In 1898, he pressed for the repairs that were necessary to keep open St. Barnabas Goswell Road, it having a congregation, he observed, of 6,000 of London's poorest. Other notices in the 1890s make clear Richards's particular brand of London churchmanship, heavily socially engaged Anglo-Catholicism. So we find him speaking at a fundraiser for the building of the All Saints Mission in Pentonville, speaking at the Brighton Church Congress, delivering a paper, Social Reforms with Regard to the Housing of the Poor, also at the annual meeting of the Clergy Relief Corporation, where he fumed that, quote, there ought to be a living wage for the clergy. They have no right to refuse to pay an educated minister as much as they would have to pay a chief clerk in any house of business. Or again, at an anniversary dinner for the Oxford House Mission in Calcutta, where Richards praised the model that had been piloted by the Mother House in Bethnal Green for its volunteers, quote, not proselytizing in the ordinary sense of the word, but sharing by their lives their real interest in people, a living sermon which politicians might do well to copy. And occasionally, and very revealingly, he offered his legal services gratis to defend what were then controversial ceremonialist innovations, such as representing the vicar and church wardens of Paynton, Devon, before the consistory court in Exeter to defend their erection of a chancel screen complete with crucifixion, or a Hampshire parish for its altar cross and candlesticks. And Richards himself was the donor for a chancel screen and altar furnishings at St. Peter Newland in Cornwall, where his brother, who was one of those commemorated at the monument, uh, was first organist and then curate. And then again showing his high church colors when Gray's Inn <coughs> um, installed a new east window in its chapel. Apologies for the bad photograph. Richards paid for the three central lights of that window, which depict the Edwardian Anglo-Catholic triumvirate of Thomas a Becket and Archbishops Whitgift and Laud. Now, Richards' estate at death in 1905 was valued at £50,000, and one full tenth of that sum, £5,000, was to be used, he instructed, for the rebuilding and sustentation of Paul's Cross. That wording is a bit of a surprise because it reveals that Richards, by his will, actually wanted a reconstruction of the old cross, not just a memorial to it. Though he did go on to make provision for the latter, a memorial, should the dean and chapter prefer. And if they didn't want either one of those, he would offer a reduced gift of £1,000 for a stained glass window in memory of his grandmother in the nave. The matter was evidently not settled quickly, since all of the early press reports speak of a full reconstruction of Paul's cross. And this seems to have caused some panic among those who did not share Richards's Anglo-Catholicism. One Frederick Hitchin Kemp, fellow of the Royal Historical Society, wrote to the Times in 1906 to explain for readers who, quote, may not be aware that a cross was in reality an open-air pulpit and was merely surmounted with a small cross so that some who would object to the erection of a cross in St. Paul's churchyard may be disposed to at least approve of the resuscitation of St. Paul's open-air pulpit. 
It was not until February 1909 that the Court of Common Council approved the Dean and Chapter's proposals, which were for Richards's middle option, a monument or memorial. And the Times carried an illustration of the approved design, as you can see as it stands today. Sensitivities about a cross, per se, were protected by surmounting the column not with a cross, but with a nine-foot statue of the patron St. Paul carrying one. And a concession to the cross as a place of preaching was made by the bronze gate leading on into a narrow standing within the balustrade. The commission for this went to Reginald Blumfield, son of the then more famous Sir Arthur Blumfield, one of the greatest ecclesiastical Gothic revivalist architects of the previous century and noted particularly for church building. But the younger Blumfield was an apt choice for an outdoor monument at St. Paul's, his reputation then resting primarily on country house and garden designs, which were consolidating the Edwardian taste for a classical revival or the style known as Renaissance, where that term is spelled W-R-E-N-A, etc., and a style epitomized perhaps then by his work commenced in the same year at Lady Margaret Hall in Oxford. And it was Blumfield, appropriately, who carried the banner in the fight for the threatened city churches in the 1920s and 30s. In October 1910, newspapers began to trail the dedication of the new monument, which was to be held on October 31st. And this, coincidentally or not, was a time when Paul's Cross was in the news for another artistic reason which must have resonated, and that was the unveiling in the middle of that month of the series of history paintings in the House of Commons corridors that had been gifted by liberal peers and included Ernest Broad's Latimer preaching before Edward VI at Paul's Cross, which firmly inscribed the cross yet again in the country's Protestant mythology. So on November 1st, the papers carried full accounts of the dedication of Richards's monument to Paul's Cross. And that in the Times merits quoting in conclusion for its resonances with the themes, both ancient and modern, of this and this evening's session. The article opened thus. After a lapse of 267 years, St. Paul's Cathedral again has its Paul's Cross, which in itself carries the residual, if incorrectly realized, hope by Richards for a reconstruction rather than a monument. And the next sentence could have been written in exactly, or written exactly 101 years later. The dedication yesterday morning was witnessed by large crowds outside the railings and a considerable number of privileged persons within. Shortly after 11 a.m., the Lord Mayor, Sheriffs, and Aldermen arrived in state, soon joined by a procession from inside the cathedral, consisting of the choir, the Dean and Chapter, and the Bishop of London, Arthur Winnington Ingram. The procession encircled the monument, and, quote, then the Bishop unlocked the bronze gate and led the way into the enclosed platform, pulled a string, and the monument was unveiled. The Archdeacon of London then led a service constituted of a psalm, a lesson from St. Luke's account of Christ's preaching at Nazareth, and a sequence of, sequence of prayers, one of which I've given you on your handout. Then Winnington Ingram's address displayed rather quaintly his medievalizing Anglo-Catholicism and his insistent referral throughout his address to the monument as this venerable and ever-precious rood, which it patently wasn't, um, as he progressed through touching the high points of the old cross's history, both Catholic and Protestant. And he told the crowd that, quote, the late Mr. Richards desired from both points of view, that is Protestant and Catholic, that the cross should be re-erected. And the bishop expressed the hope that the dean and chapter would conduct outdoor services from it. But he continued, even if that were not possible, he said that he hoped, quote, at any rate, the cross would be constantly preaching a silent sermon to London. As the weary man out of work passed, he would think of the one who had borne a much worse burden on whose sympathy he could rely. And as the rich city merchant passed, it would remind him of one who, though rich for our sakes, became poor. And if anything could make him an unselfish steward of his riches, it would be this cross. And so my colleagues will now sketch for us how this was done in the days of old Paul's cross, and it will be for us to discuss later just how eloquent the silent sermon of its replacement has been more recently. Um, first of all, thanks to the St. Paul's Institute and our de democratic heritage for asking me to speak. Um, and I should say straight away that I'm here slightly under false pretenses in that I'll have 
very little to say in what follows about Paul's Cross itself. And um, for obvious reasons, I'm leaving that to my colleague, Dr. Morrissey, who has, as we've heard, um, quite literally written the book on the subject. Um, instead, what I want to do in the time that I've got is say a little bit about freedom of speech in the early modern period. Um, what was understood by it, what its legal status was, and how it was justified and described both within and without the bounds of the law at this time. Now, when I was writing a book about freedom of speech in the early 17th century, um, that's to say freedom of speech in the early 17th century, I, I wasn't there. Um, the first question that a lot of people asked me was, was there any? And it was a very good question. By this, they didn't mean were there any frank speakers in existence before the Bill of Rights was passed? What they meant was, usually, was there any conception of freedom of speech as a right, as something that was protected or claimed by people in this period? And the answer, as my questioners soon became aware, and probably while they regretted severely having asked me in the first place, um, was that it's all rather complicated the short answer is that there was only one place in early modern England, by which I mean roughly the period from 1500 to 1700, there was only one place where freedom of speech was conceived of as what we might recognise as a protected right, and that was in Parliament. It's well known that at the beginning of every parliamentary session, uh, the Speaker of the House of Commons made a series of petitions to the monarch, among which was the request that members be allowed to speak freely as was their right. Uh, the other privileges that were asked for were um, access to the monarch, um, for the speaker to be interpreted kindly should he misspeak, um, and for freedom of arrest, which is a parliamentary privilege we've heard a little about in recent years as well, of course. But the origins of this right to free speech um, and especially its place as a formal request that would be expected to be granted the royal rubber stamp, as it were, are murky in the extreme. It first appears in Sir Thomas More's speech to the King at the start of the 1523 session of Parliament, um, and this is that. Even though the records of these protestations by speakers survive from fairly regularly from 1377 onwards. So, Moore's request seems to have been an innovation, but there's no evidence whatever that it was treated as such. And by the early years of Elizabeth I's reign, the request had not only become a standard part of the Speaker's protestations, but was referred to in terms such as according to the old ancient order. In other words, within the space of a little over 30 years, an innovation had evolved in what we might see as a rather peculiarly and typically British way um, into an ancient liberty. Now, the existence of this right or privilege um, doesn't mean that MPs were allowed to say whatever they liked. Firstly, when the Lord Keeper or Lord Chancellor replied to the Common Speaker's protestations, as they were bound to do, they customarily granted the request for freedom of speech, but they hedged it around with limitations. Under James I, for example, members were warned not to turn liberty of speech into license or break the reverence due to a sovereign. So the question inevitably turned to what constituted liberty and what <coughs> constituted license and who was authorised to make the distinction. Elizabeth I, James and Charles I after him all firmly believed that it was the monarch who was so authorised. Many MPs, meanwhile, equally firmly held that it was their place as a corporate body to police the line and also to punish those who they believed had crossed it. This difference of opinion, to put it rather mildly, led to fiery exchanges between monarch and MPs, as well as between MP and MP, and to a series of parliamentary sessions where very little business could be achieved at all. Some members regarded this as the necessary price to pay for protecting their liberties. The King, and indeed several other members of Parliament, regarded it as obstructionism of the worst kind. And when we look to this period for the origins of our own notions of freedom, I think we should be careful to take both of those points of view into account. <laughs> 
So, so much for the Westminster Village. Um, what about the wider world and the justifications for speaking freely that were claimed there? And what of the forms as well that such speech took? In the time I've got remaining, I want to say a little bit about both of these and before glancing very briefly at some connections that we might make with our contemporary concerns and practices. So there were, I think, two main justifications claimed for the right or duty to speak frankly in this period. And in discussing both of these, I think it's worth stressing that very frequently when discussing rights and duties, early modern people did so very much without a sense or an expectation that they would be exempt from punishment. In a way, they partook of a more positive version of Thomas Hobbes's very bleak argument in Leviathan, published in 1651, that unless you were physically constrained from doing something, you were free to do it. Should you suffer as a result, then that was, strictly speaking, irrelevant. Now, that doesn't mean that early modern frank speakers <coughs> were rushing to have their hands chopped off and their cheeks branded to of the common punishments, quite the reverse, as we'll see. But it does mean that they, when they discussed free speech, they tended to do so outside of the existing philosophical discourse of rights, which was highly complex and sophisticated and for which I don't have time today. So the first justification for speaking freely is what we could call the civic argument. In pursuing this, early modern English people sought to establish a connection with an idealised classical past, be it Athens or Rome, just as John Milton did by quoting Euripides on the title page of Areopagitica, published in 1641, his celebrated and unsuccessful plea from, for freedom from uh, pre-publication licensing laws. Um, except for Catholics, of course. This is true liberty, he said, quoting Euripides, when free-born men, having to advise the public, may speak free. Combining these ancient sources with a notion, often a rather hazy one, of a native tradition of counselling or advising, and casting themselves as citizens, not subjects, the proponents of this argument claimed that they had an obligation to offer advice to the monarch, however unpalatable it might be, and whether or not they possessed the status of officially recognised councillors. Now, the second justification for speaking freely is the one that's most relevant to our surroundings and our topic today, and that's the religious one, of course. When I say that these two justifications were um, in parallel, I mean to stress that all English people at this time believed that the mon monarchy or commonwealth in which they lived was a Christian one, even when they seemed extremely keen to pull on a toga. Religious justifications for speaking frankly asserted the Christian's duty to Christ and to his own conscience above all else, even the obligation of the law, and drew inspiration from the examples of the prophets, the apostles, the bishops of the early church in their very testy exchanges with emperors, and from Christ himself, of course. And Mary will say a little more, I think, about how this also vitally informed the preacher's understanding of his own duty. The key factor I want to draw attention to is the way that both civic and religious arguments emphasise the need to ignore the otherwise ever-present obligations to speak decorously, with deference to the time, place and persons that constituted the context of any utterance. Being pressed by duty you should speak the truth in season and out of season. The only context that was important was the clear and present danger that you perceived. As the religious pamphleteer Thomas Scott put it, justifying his outspokenness in a book that went through seven editions in a single year, but also saw him forced to flee to Holland, for such as say that the examples which either are or may be brought to countenance this course of mine are extraordinary and therefore not safe to follow, I answer that therefore they are to be followed because they are extraordinary, for such examples fit extraordinary times and occasions best. Now that appeal to extraordinary measures in extraordinary times, by the way, I think is one that should perhaps give us pause, being like so many other statements that I've mentioned open to use on more than one side. So where and how then did these frank speakers do their speaking? 
in Parliament, of course, and as we've just seen, in pamphlets, perhaps also in pulpits. Another prime medium for criticising the authorities and especially warning the monarch against listening to the advice of flatterers and evil counsellors with their own interests at heart was the libel. And by libel, I mean a short text, usually in verse, that was distributed in handwritten rather than printed form. Early modern people used the term with a strong sense of its origin in the Latin libellus, meaning simply little book. These libels, often highly defamatory, uh, almost exclusively written ad hominem, were exchanged by friends, copied into notebooks, and that's where we find them today, the original single sheets that they would have been distributed in, uh, either too fragile to have survived or would have been destroyed. And they're also distributed in public places. Another word for these texts was pasquils, taken from the name of a statue in Rome, which still stands to this day, Paschino, to which scurrilous papers were attached. And um, anybody who knows Paschino will know that it was an extremely popular location for unfavorable comments on the esteemed former Prime Minister Silvio Berlusconi. And this brings me to my sole example of a St. Paul's related incident in my remarks today, because in 1629, two of these pasquils, one of them attacking the Bishop of London, was deposited in the Dean of Paul's, his yard before his house, the Dean in question being, of course, John Dunn. I don't know whether the present Dean would have any similar stories to share with us, but that's something perhaps we can find out in due course. Once again here, um, definition rears its head. When were these pasquils, or libels, an outlet for reasoned grievances that had no other forum to be heard? And when were they merely defamatory outbursts whose authors shielded themselves behind anonymity? When, in other words, was a libel simply libelous? Now, there are many things I haven't had time to mention which are of considerable relevance. Um, the pre-publication licensing of printed books, the post-publication censorship, book burning, the cruel and unusual punishments that were meted out on those who were deemed to have broken the law when they spoke frankly. Also, on the other side, the riots and personal assaults that were brought about by some acts of frank speaking in the period, the libel writer's habitual recourse to mudslinging, xenophobia and downright untruth. But I want to end by mentioning some connections and some gaps between the past and the present. Like us, early modern people worried over definitions. One person's free expression was another's act of defamation. And they worried over issues such as anonymity or who has the right to speak for the people, as we saw in the example of Thomas Scott titling his book ambitiously Vox Populi. Like us, they recognised that free speech costs. And like us, they spoke of it as a right. Also, often, as I've said, as a duty, a word that's perhaps used a little less often now. But unlike us, they believed that its claims to universality were questionable. They did this in ways that might and should alarm us. Some people, by dint of their office, had more freedom of speech than others. But they also did so in ways that we might think about when we invoke notions like the marketplace of ideas or level playing fields. For they often argued that occasion, extraordinary times, meant that oppressed persons or groups should be allowed greater freedom to speak than those who oppressed them. They were willing to pay the costs of free speech. We, I suggest, may be paying the cost of not considering how universalizing arguments can reinforce rather than leveling out existing imbalances of power. Thank you with the same picture as Peter, pretty much. Um, and like David, I'll be talking about free speech in the context of particular people and particular places, and um, with Paul's Cross particularly in mind. So this is the monument in the churchyard, and it tells us that on this plot of ground stood the old Paul St. Paul's, Cross where at amid such scenes of good and evil as make up human affairs, the conscience of church and nation through five centuries found public utterance. 
Um, I, I sort of worry a lot about whether or not this is quite right, and I don't really know. But there is one inaccuracy, because Paul's Frost didn't stand there. It stood there. Um, not far away, but it's actually um, on, on the corner of the, the current cathedral. I think a big part of why Paul's Cross, why this particular outdoor pulpit um, might claim to have t um, played a role in um, uh, forming the conscience of church and nation, has a lot to do with simply where it was and has as much to do with the cathedral um, and the cathedral surroundings as anything specific to the pulpit itself. Um, it's an open space in what was an increasingly crowded city. Um, and so it was used for public proclamations. Um, the defeat of the Spanish Armada, the succession of King James, were all um, publicly proclaimed from, um, from Paul's Cross. It was also useful for other, rather more punitive public statements. Those were caught on the wrong side of the, of religious orthodoxy in the 1530s and 40s um, often did penance at Paul's Cross. Those found guilty of heresy um, would appear carrying bundles of wood, carrying faggots of wood, which indicated the penalty they would pay if they lapsed into error again. They would be burned. Um, those guilty of scandalous sexual behaviour, like the notorious cross-dressing Mal Firth, um, did penance at Paul's Cross, penance turned up wrapped in a white sheet to show how sorry they were and stood by the pulpit while the preacher told all of those listening what evil people they were but how sorry they were now really. Um, so priests who changed religious allegiance during the period also delivered recantation sermons at Paul's Cross um, and books were burned in the churchyard again in displays of orthodoxy. But I love this description of, of Mal Firth's um, penance because it shows how these um, displays of public authority um, could go quite badly wrong. Um, the authorities had to manage these displays of authority and sometimes they managed them quite badly. Um, the preacher who, who Chamberlain describes as dainty, he was a rather young man and just not fit for the job and was clearly totally outclassed by Mal, um, who turned up already drunk. Um, and so her weeping was not the tears of a penitent, um, but the sort of maudlin drunk um, effect of too much. What did she have? It was claret or sack or sack, of course. Is it. Um, so, so Paul's Cross was a place that the authorities could use to make very bold statements of what was orthodox and what was allowed. But it was also a place where that could backfire if it didn't work out properly. The cross also um, lay at the centre of London's um, news gathering networks. The middle aisle of St Paul's in the cathedral um, had always been notorious for gossip and continued to be throughout this period. Um, Johnson's Every Man, um, in his, um, Every Man Out of His Humour has a whole act set in Paul's Walk where, where people are, are coming to hang out and listen to gossip. Somewhere around the cathedral there was also a functioning theatre for quite a lot of the time. We think it may have been in the south, but we're not really sure. So St Paul's Cross is near the places that people are coming to to collect news and collect gossip. And that's before we even begin to look at its immediate surroundings, which is at Paternoster Row, beside the, the greatest concentration of bookshops in the city. Um, Peter Blaney, who has reconstructed the churchyard, has said that pretty much every shop in this area at one stage was a bookshop. Um, I have this sort of fond notion of, of the stationers putting their ear out the door on a Sunday morning to see if the sermon would be worth, would be worth printing afterwards. Some of them were <laughs> printed quite soon. Um, so, so the sermons were newsworthy. Um, they were a reasonably good investment, not a super investment, but a reasonably good investment for the printers. Um, some of them did prove very popular. Um, and so the reach of the Paul's Cross sermons was not just London-based. Um, they could also, um, were, were sold um, quite widely and travelled throughout England. Um, indeed, when Richard Bancroft preached an anti-Presbyterian sermon in 1589, um, the Presbyterian ministers of Edinburgh had a reply in print and in England by the end of that year. 
So it isn't hard to argue that Paul's Cross played a role in the evolution of our ideas about political participation and free speech, but I think it did so primarily as part of a larger story of the ways in which the Reformation made religion a matter of political allegiance and made politics a matter of conscience. I think we should beware of jumping to the conclusion that ordinary people's contribution to religious debate at this time constituted an exertion of a newfound right to speak freely, as, as David has indicated. My thinking about the way Paul's Cross works is very influenced by an article by Peter Lake and Steve Pincus on the public sphere in early modern England. And they describe a post-Reformation public sphere in which ordinary people contributed to political debate but sporadically, and sometimes with the prompting of those with a more direct voice in public matters. Members of the regime, Lake and Pincus say, made public pitches. They used the print, pulpit and theatre to address popular audiences, but they could then use the response of those audiences as part of their leveraging for position um, among the political elite at court and parliament. Paul's Cross was a place that promoted orthodoxy and obedience, and sometimes it was a place where voices opposed to royal policy had their say, but that really depended on who managed to control the pulpit at any time. One of the reasons why Paul's Cross voiced so many different opinions and distant voices was because it was quite badly organised. And it's one of the paradoxes of Paul's Cross that as soon as it gets very well organised, becomes a a kind of a a sleek propaganda machine, it's at that point that it becomes so uninteresting that people stop listening and it loses its its purpose. Um, This is a 1616 depiction of a Paul's Cross sermon. We can see the pulpit here in the foreground and in the background there is the so-called sermon house, the, the box. Um, where the elite sat. Now, in this picture, the monarch is there. The, the monarch, uh, Elizabeth, James and Charles, came to Paul's Cross, but only once each. Usually, the people in those boxes would have been the Lord Mayor um, and, and Alderman of London and also the Bishop of London. Now, the Bishop nominally had control over Paul's Cross. It was his um, right to appoint the preachers. It was also his problem, because coming up with 52 people, preachers who were capable of giving a two-hour oration to a very demanding audience wasn't easy. And in the early part of Elizabeth's reign, the endowments that paid the preachers had dried up, so many preachers were reluctant to bother. Um, So the bishop sometimes had to call on preachers whose obedience, whose kind of commitment to the ecclesiastical regime was conditional, those we would often call Puritans. The bishop had to use what he had available. The London Corporation had no formal control over the preachers, but they were the ones who were there every week, Um, and so they were the ones who were in best position to comment when things out of turn um, were said by the preachers. And they also controlled the endowments that did come in later in James's reign, and I sometimes think the Corporation wondered why the pairs of the piper didn't get to call the tune. The bishop... Um, the royal government, the Privy Council and the corporation were all part of the same political elite. They were all part of the government, if you like, but their interests were not necessarily aligned. Money, religious divisions over Puritanism and demarcations of authority, the tussle between the corporation and the court over public theatres, for example, could all put these different authorities at loggerheads and they were not above using Paul's Cross to brief against each other on those occasions. Um, When the regime was under threat, they all pulled together. When it wasn't, they tended to use Paul's Cross as one of the means by which they made public pitches um, against each other. So much for the space. um, This is a picture of the choir where the sermons were transferred in 1634 when work began on the cathedral. It's a smaller space, it's more easily controlled, but the interesting thing is that when the sermons came into the choir, there's no comment from diarists or from manuscript writers or from print that I've come across that lamented the fact that the old outdoor pulpit had been taken down. Um, Paul's Cross had stopped functioning as a, a, a part of this nascent public sphere, I think, by then, because it was so well organized by the authorities. The preachers who spoke from this pulpit talked about 
their understanding of preaching in eloquent terms. But typical of the age, they described it um, with reference to quotations from scripture. So what I'm going to say about the preacher's um, account of their speaking, we'll also look at these scriptural quotations. The Paul's Cross preachers did believe in the efficacy of preaching. They did believe that the Reformation, and not just a Reformation of confessional identity, but a moral Reformation, was possible if it was preached often enough and with enough conviction. Um, they quoted 1 Corinthians 1.21, God has chosen the foolishness of preaching as his means to save sinners. And a corollary of this was that they thought of preaching not merely as a way of speaking about things that were wrong, they considered it an action. It was part of the solution to the problems that their hearers faced. They believed that preaching could change hearts and minds because God had promised help, the help of the Holy Spirit, to the preachers and the hearers. The sermon was not merely an oration. It had a charisma that secular rhetoric lacked. 2 Timothy 4.2, preach the word, be instant, in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine, was the most cited passage from the Bible about preaching. From the second part of the passage, reprove, rebuke, exhort, preachers fine-tuned literary conventions for different purposes and occasions, sermons to reprove sin, sermons of comfort, sermons of doctrine. From the first, be instant, in season, out of season, they derived an unambiguous obligation to preach the gospel. Often the message that they delivered from Paul's cross and elsewhere wasn't politically subversive. It was the humdrum stuff about not getting drunk, honouring father and mother, not coveting neighbour's horse or wife or mule or other things. And they repeated this even when commenting that the audience had heard it all before. But they were to deliver this message with a sense of urgency. The OED defines instant as to urge, to ask for a thing urgently. Um, early modern translations of the Bible all translate this phrase as to be instant. I think the best modern version to capture this is the New Jerusalem Bibles, proclaim the message and welcome or unwelcome, insist on it. Preaching was not a political right, but a duty that trumped political considerations. Even though the monarch was supreme governor of the church, preaching was a function regulated by, but independent of, political authority. That didn't make preachers necessarily form a political op um, opposition. Discreet preaching tempered zeal with a sense of place and occasion. Governors should not be embarrassed in front of those they govern, for example. Matters of religion were sharply distinguished from politics. Taxation was a clear dividing line. But when the core message of the gospel, such as the real presence of Christ in the sacrament, did become a political matter, then the duty to be instant could clash with political expediency. Preachers rarely quoted their contemporaries, but among the few Englishmen cited by Paul's cross preachers is Hugh Latimer. In a sermon of 1548, Latimer compared scripture to meat, not strawberries that come but once a year and tarry not long. Strawberry preachers became a byword for negligent preachers. It's a very descriptive phrase, but I think Latimer's own example of being instant, in season, out of season, helps explain why the phrase was so resonant for those who followed him at Paul's cross. The last of the biblical quotations I will cite is one often repeated in sermons. It's carved into pulpits and it's engraved on the great, bell, Paul, the great Paul bell of this cathedral. Woe unto me if I preach not the gospel, 1 Corinthians 9.16. Preaching for these men was not the exercise of a right, but the fulfilment of an obligation. But their faith in the spoken word, delivered with urgency and conviction, was, I think, vindicated. England did become Protestant, and that is the single biggest cultural change that England saw between the Norman Conquest and the Industrial Revolution. Unlike those two events, however, it came about neither because of military power or the power of capital, but because of the foolishness of preaching. As a lecturer in an English department, I take comfort from this fact, and it is a big part of the reason why I study Paul's Cross. Well, thank you to our, our speakers for three wonderful presentations. I've learned a, a huge amount, uh, and we can launch into our, our discussion shortly. I should just say one or two words more about what 
brought me here and the uh, publishing in the churchyard is part of it. Um, some uh, quite long time ago now I inherited a beautiful piece of furniture and with it came some papers uh, and in those papers uh, it emerged that uh, some of my ancestors had um, uh, written the People's Charter in the 1830s and had a publishing house um, on Queen's Head Passage and now sadly uh, a Thai restaurant um, without a blue plaque. Um, uh, and they were deeply involved in the campaign for uh, a press without tax, punitive taxation in the early 19th century. And that was what, first of all, brought me to uh, a, an interest in that aspect of our democratic heritage. And of course, uh, that uh, publishing uh, industry was uh, uh, an outgrowth of the, the religi principally religious uh, and originally uh, manuscript uh, production center around uh, the cathedral. So that, in a sense, is what brought me into this discussion. I think we've heard, uh, as I say, three uh, wonderful presentations about the, the development of, uh, of speech, uh, politics, and religion um, uh, in the period. And I'd like very much now to, uh, to bring in uh, the audience into the, into the discussion. Um, I think it was, and, and, and they do say as much. Um, a, a German visitor um, in 1599 said that the, the preacher had a bottle of wine in the pulpit to refresh himself with because of the physical effort. I hope he didn't refresh himself too often. Um, but the physical effort of, of preaching outdoors was great. And other preachers do comment on the fact that they were unable to make themselves heard outside. Um, so I think they tried very hard and, and those who could project their voice did make themselves heard. Um, I think listening was a skill that they had perfected in a way that we don't. Um, I, th I think they were better at listening for longer. And, and they were enthusiastic sermon goers. It is hard to believe sometimes. But, but, but they did. Um, Paul Siebert has written a book on preaching in London um, at this period. And... and shows the extent of the demand for preaching in London. Um, Arnold Hunt's book on, on preaching in England also shows it, it was popular. People did want to hear sermons and were content to sit and listen to them. Do either of you gentlemen? Just, just to add very briefly, the, um, <clears throat> there was a particular acoustic, given the way the Paul's Cross Churchyard was configured. Um, the, <clears throat> Two of, uh, of the arms of the right angle were the cathedral building itself, very tall. And some of the better reconstructions we've seen done by scholars recently show that the um, whole row of shops that closed it off on the other two sides effectively made an amphitheater. Um, so added to that, the training in oratory, which was the basis of the humanist education that all of these preachers would have learned, and the skills at listening, it was clearly possible. It could be difficult, but people went and, 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 and heard. It might have had something to do with the desire to promulgate printed copies, perhaps. <laughs> and it's also maybe worth mentioning that there's a, there's a major um, North American uh, funded project to mm. try to reconstruct um, Paul's Cross in virtual terms, which at the moment has on its website three examples of trying to hear in an audience of I think it's 200, 400, and about 6,000 um, with a preacher surrounded by noises of clacking hooves and seagulls and whatever. And it, I don't how accurate that is, who knows, but it's an instructive thing to listen to. Um, I don't know about the medieval sermons. Um, a lot of the preaching um, in the Middle Ages, the Paul's Cross were by mendicant preachers, and I think that the, the bishop did have oversight. Um, what happens at the Reformation is with the toing and froing of religious allegiance, the Bishop of London and the government may not be in agreement with each other, and so there's quite a lot of tussling over Paul's Cross in the 1530s that gets quite complicated. Um, things settle down later in Elizabeth's reign, but, but I think the money issue just makes it hard for the bishop to control. Also, until the 16, late 1620s, the bishop doesn't know what the preacher will say until it's said. 
Um, the preacher doesn't submit a copy of his sermon in advance. So we do have cases where the bishop has to basically chase after the preacher afterwards for an apology. <laughs> It, 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 but it is an important part of that increasing control in what we now call the Laudian period, that Laud, when Bishop of London initiated the practice of requiring a copy in advance. Um, I'm, I'm glad, very glad Please. that you raised that because that is a very hardy perennial in the civic historical memory. Um, the assumption that was held as fact, certainly by the Elizabethan antiquarians who first started writing this kind of thing down, that uh, the site of Paul's Cross was the site of the ancient Anglo-Saxon folk moot. Um, when putting together this panel, I searched high and low to find an Anglo-Saxonist who would be able to enlighten us on that. Um, and my first choice was Professor Sarah Foote, the professor of ecclesiastical history at, at Oxford. And she thought about it long and hard and looked long and hard and said, I can't come up with anything that shows that that is anything more than a myth. Um, it is a, a, a vibrant assumption in the period when St. Paul's Cross is um, going full tilt in the 16th and 17th century, and the city is forever pointing to that, um, especially not so much in respect to St. Paul's Cross as a preaching place, but St. Paul's Cross as property, um, with the beginnings of these long, complicated, which also played out in Occupy, confusions over who owns what plots of ground. And the city claims were based on what is, it, as I understand it, an undocumentable belief, myth, depending on what you want to call it, that it was a place of civic assembly. Mm. I, I think your, your um, sense that the city and the corporation is a key player here it is a very important one, and, and um, um, now being firmly locked in my notes on Paul's Cross, the next thing I'm going to look at in detail are the Spittal sermons, which are very, very badly understudied. Um, one of the things that I think happens at the Reformation is the corporation has to reorder a lot of its civic religious ritual and increasingly they use Paul's cross as the focus of that ritual um, so, um, or they use sermons in other civic venues um, as, a, as a focus of, of civic religious ritual. So processions through the city, um, say at Whitsunday, um, get replaced with sermons at Paul's cross um, and Control over the spittal sermons is something that um, the corporation are very wary of. There is some kind of dispute or some kind of tension between the bishop and the corporation over the appointment of the spittal preachers, which I haven't been able to dig through the archives enough to really get to grips on. Um, but the, the use of the space for civic displays of, of civic allegiance, if you like, by attending sermons is a very important part of the corporation's investment in Paul's Cross. If I can uh, elaborate a little, I don't think uh, we are here uh, at the instruction of the Bishop of London um, with, with pre-authorised uh, texts to deliver the uh, definitive version. Uh, we're, we're, we're here to initiate and develop a conversation. And I think that there are many uh, more uh, such discussions to be had about the development of this particular uh, church, the space around it, and indeed its relationship with the, with the city. And I hope we will have more of them this evening and also on, on other occasions. I think there is a question in my mind, um, having an extremely ancient uh, medieval, very old, I should say, medieval and modern history degree, um, that I, I seem to recall that there was some space in our history between the Anglo-Saxons and the Reformation. Um, um, and, uh, well, I might have got that wrong. Um, and I, I wonder what, uh, whether the panelists or others here can help illuminate the role of um, discussion and the role of this uh, place in our political life in um, the, let us say, the period from the conquest through to the, the Reformation. But, uh, um, if I could cut, uh, try to keep both of those things together because I, I, I appreciate what, what, what's coming from the back there. Um, 
With respect to pre-Reformation sermons, the great challenge is that we're also talking about pre-print, and the number of sermon texts from St. Paul's Cross is tiny um, in comparison, so it's very difficult to generalize, although we know that the cross was built in the 12th century and had a flourishing medieval life, and I wouldn't want anyone to leave here um, with the false Protestant notion that Paul's cross was invented by the Reformation, that, that certainly <laughs> didn't happen. Um, but I've, Mary, you've literally, Mary has literally read and studied every single Paul's cross sermon that exists, and I just wonder if you pick up in that, because it seems to me that what the corporation is doing when they come to Paul's cross is a display of unity. Um, did, do you get any evidence um, of this kind of friction? Uh, well, as I said, there is much work still to be done on this um, in the corporation records, and, and um, I suspect what happens is that Paul's Cross becomes more elitist. It becomes a venue where the corporation, the Lord Mayor and the Aldermen, gather. Um, and so tensions between them and the livery men are less likely to play out. Um, at the moment, th th there is much work to be done, but at the moment, I, th I think one indication of this is the quiescence of the corporation to taking down the pulpit in 1634 and moving the, um, the, the sermons inside. And of course, the corporation in the 30s are very much um, th their um, monopoly traders and, and farmers who, who have a big investment in Charles I's regime. Um, and so they're very happy to go along with what's happening. Um, 1642, when there's the, the Common Council elections have, have, have really changed the shape of the corporation and more radical um, voices are in charge, particularly Isaac Pennington um, being the Lord Mayor, suddenly the corporation get very interested in what's happening at Paul's Cross. They start petitioning the House of Commons for control of the endowments. They start going to the cathedral to see where they can hold the sermons in the meantime. And the sermons continue to take place in the cathedral, but they're sermons before the Lord Mayor and the Aldermen. So, so, so Paul's Cross mutates from a venue where a very wide audience of, of London people gather to one which I think becomes more elitist. Now, there probably is a very interesting story to be told on how exactly that happens. Um, and um, all I have at the moment is the Paul's Cross perspective, but, but the, the civic perspective from the, the corporation and the livery company records is, is something that's on top of the to-do list, not quite <laughs> top of the to-do list, but near top of the to-do list. And sounds like there's room for others too. Mm. Uh, well, let's see if we can bring in some more uh, people. Uh, lady right at the front. Um, uh, <laughs> I'm still at 1642. Um, I think the Corporation of London um, is... Um, Kind of more religiously and politically conservative um, than Cromwell's independent party. Um, and so from basically from, from the, um, at the end of the first civil war, they're increasingly marginalized um, in, in politics. And I think the Paul's Cross sermons, the ones I've looked at from the 40s and 50s, are kind of preaching to the choir. It's very kind of straightforward, old-fashioned Presbyterian Puritanism, and the radical voices that you start to hear elsewhere are not being heard. So much so that one radical whose aim I can't now remember um, is questioned because he delivers a sermon in the churchyard from what appears to be the stump of the old pulpit because um, he was denied access to the pulpit within St. Paul's. Um, so there is continued tension then in the 40s between what's happening outside and the cathedral, but the cathedral, um, which is where the Paul's Cross sermons are now taking place, is less politically and religiously radical. Thanks. Gentlemen. Do you want to? Uh... Um, well, I'd, I'd say I agree <laughs> um, in brief, and I just add. I mean, I guess what I'd also like to say is, is I sort of hoped that um, your point about the Commonwealth was and appeals to it, and also the ways in which speakers could um, choose to operate both within and without particular bounds of acceptable 
speech, that is, acceptable risky speech, um, was, was there already. I mean, I, I just add a couple of things. Um, the first, I suppose, would be to say that you're right, the range of those is also very various, including everything from trying to petition the king when he's out hunting, which is generally acceptable, unless you happen to get him on a bad day or you hand him something that you know, misquotes his own book or something, but also to <laughs> think about other appeals, not simply to notions of the Commonwealth and its own um, expectations uh, for your um, rights is perhaps going too far, um, but also, as I said, to these other spaces. So if we were to go back to my suggestion that people drew on ancient Roman or ancient Greek ideas, they would draw um, on, for example, the notion of Roman law and say that you are a free person if you are not under the dominion of somebody else. And that is a really very radical statement in the period, but it's one that is frequently made. Um, of course, citizens were, strictly speaking, subjects. Um, they were subject to somebody else, the king and his officers. Um, but they would also appeal, not simply to that very secular tradition, but also to another one as being members of a Christian commonwealth, something far larger than the commonwealth, the geographical or the polity um, in which they lived, but as the membership of uh, Christendom. And within that, they would also lay claim to certain liberties and rights, Christian liberty, which could indeed involve speaking freely and frankly and taking no account of temporal laws, um, but rather speaking from their conscience, as Mary described as well. So I think there's, there is a lot there, and we, we need thicker accounts of all of those possibilities, yes. Do you want to... Uh, um, I don't have much to add except to, to, to quote, again, in, in agreement um, with Arnold's comments, um, uh, Phil Withington has, has done work on um, the idea of, of um, civic culture um, and democratic ideas within that, and, and he points to specific, again, specific places and specific moments um, when those normally outside of the political elite um, did consider that they had a right to a voice. So at a parish level, everyone within the parish might have a right to a voice in the election of, say, the vergers or, or the church wardens. So we, we obviously don't have um, democracy as we would configure it in the early modern period, but we do have, as, as Anne pointed out, spaces where there are possibilities, um, and, and as David said, so, so it, it's a more complicated picture. It's site-specific, time-specific, place-specific, and, and also specific to particular people. Thank you. Um, gentlemen there have been very patient. Um, yes, um, and... <laughs> Um, I, I, I think you're right to to bring up the um, the degree to which um, the, the kind of trauma of the 40s affects everything um, um, in, um, connected with not just um, preaching but also the wider um, uh, devotional life as well. But the degree to which um, the Catholic response, they feel very keenly the loss of the public pulpit um, and become very adept at using print publications um, in response to that. So we have a very complicated <coughs> media in early modern England for, for religious writing. Um, and I suppose when we're talking about free speech, the, the fact that some speech was prohibited from the pulpit needs to be part of that equation. Um, but they did find ways to answer through through print. Yeah, I, I could just add to that too. I think um, a potential disciplinary divide uh, I, I, is being revealed to me. Um, I think it's an historian who says that the Paul's Cross sermons between 1540 and 1580 are the most exciting. I think to a literary person, they're almost dull, or at least boring, because they're so straightforward, because they're so polemical. There's, no, there's very little use of any kind of sophisticated rhetorical strategies to hide your point or to speak to a knowing audience. And it's those literary strategies that make for more sophisticated preaching in literary terms that seemed to me to come to the fore in the Jacobean period, when controls are being tightened, and you get the fluorescence of someone like Dunn, 
who, as Arnold has suggested, can serve up something that he, if challenged, could say simply a, a simple moral observation, but which could be incredibly loaded um, if you understood the political context and could be incredibly daring and is all the more exciting, at least literarily and potentially for a listener, um, if you're one of those elites who knows how to read the doublespeak that some of these preachers begin to refine um, in the 1600s to about 20. Five or four yeah, or so. Yeah. Yeah. They get very, very boring in there. <laughs> <laughs> From a literary. I, I, I say that as someone who's read quite a <laughs> Peter, uh, uh, because we have to draw to a close, I wanted to ask you uh, a little bit more about the late Victorian Edwardian mm. period. Um, when I was in another life, when I was researching uh, the history of impeachment with respect to Mr. Blair um, and looking back at uh, its origins, um, I discovered that uh, a man who had some people describe as the, the Rousseau or the Marx of the English Revolution, said would uh, Coke, um, a, a, a legal officer for Elizabeth, um, to cut a long story short, uh, that he developed, he brought together everything that could be brought together about the rights of Parliament uh, in response to James. Uh, and the Victorians um, did recognise this, and on Stoke Page's golf course now, if you uh, brave the golf courses on the fairway, and you make your pay, uh, way past where uh, the Americans have um, commemorated uh, William Penn uh, and Gray's Elegy, uh, you find that uh, he has a beautiful uh, country house where Charles I was banged up, which is now uh, in the possession of management consultants. Um, but there is an 86-foot uh, uh, column with the statue to Edward Cook upon it, um, erected sometime around 1900. And then coming across Paul, the Paul's Cross Memorial, I wonder if there's some broader theme in late Victorian um, Edwardian society where people in quite high society, because these were not being put up, as you pointed out, these were not being put up by the trade unionists, mm -hmm. um, um, that there was a reference back to um, uh, ancient and early modern uh, figures in our society, and I wonder whether you, without any notice, <laughs> could sort of co comment, comment on whether or not this memorial was part of some broader, um, you know, the ch whether the chap who put it up and put it in his will felt he was part of some broader movement. The movement that he specifically was most involved in is the one I alluded to, and that's preservation of city mm -hmm. churches, and he was, a, as it were, a, an amateur antiquarian. Um, but... Uh, I did gesture to that other coincidence, as I described it, of those very important murals in the House of Commons, yes. which is an extremely good example of, in that case, liberal peers yes. um, promulgating a vision of the English past, which, just to cut to the chase because we're almost out of time, um, certainly participates in what historians now would call a, a, a Whig view of history, that might romanticize and simplify a kind of evolution of, of, of English democracy um, and search for its roots wherever they can and turn a blind eye to the inequalities that, 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 that perhaps came along with it. Um, and Richard seems to me a textbook example of that kind of um, optimistic reading of the progress of democracy in, in, in England. Okay, but you. I'm not a Victorianist, yes. so I hasten to add. Well, I'm sure we can, we can mingle <laughs> informally. Um, it seems to me um, that we maybe started off with a fear that we were being sort of offered a, a necklace of artificial pearls of, uh, of wisdom that, about uh, our heritage and history. Um, and uh, the fear, I think, is that you get into it and you, you find that this is a discussion not about pearls but all about um, rather unpleasant oyster shells and the historians want to give you the context and before you know it we're discussing the whole ocean um, and discussing the sediment. Um, but at the end of the day it seems to me that we uh, are clear that there is a, a string, uh, not necessarily particularly well joined up, but there is a string of vital um, and very beautiful and important uh, pearls of our democratic heritage uh, in and from this space. And I thank our uh, panel for helping o open up the oysters and understand uh, these pearls for what they are. So I hope you'll join with me in thanking them for their erudition this afternoon. Thank you.